Now, your forecast first. Good evening. We have a very warm and humid night ahead. Temperatures only dropping down to the lower 70s with some scattered rain showers and thunderstorms. We have more rain in the forecast for tomorrow, and I'll have more on that ahead. Eyewitness News first at 10 starts now. Local news that matters. This is Eyewitness News first at 10. Tonight first at 10, Sculpture Space, a community studio for artists in West Utica, was vandalized sometime over this weekend. And Utica's gun buyback event this weekend was a success. I'll have more from the Attorney General coming up tonight. Plus, Governor Hochul recently signed Dakota's law, which aims to help protect kids from lead poisoning. Capital correspondent Jamie DeLine has that story. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight for Eyewitness News at 10. I'm Shelby Pei, filling in this week for Jamie Ajoule. Sculpture Space, a community studio for artists in West Utica, has been severely vandalized over the weekend. Officials from the studio say that vandals broke into the Gates Street facility anywhere between late Friday and early Sunday morning. These photos were taken when they were first entering the building. And Executive Director Tom Mantan describes the damage he discovered. Dishes everywhere, computers with, um, with uh, hammer marks on the back of them and in the front of them. Bikes were stolen and, and disappeared, so where those went to, I don't really know, but those are the things we kind of know and, and what, it, what it means for who did this, I don't know. It's, it's just, it makes no sense to me. It really absolutely makes no sense. The facility does not have surveillance cameras, and as the director says, the board and leadership has no speculation as to who is responsible for the destruction. Eyewitness News spoke with Utica Police, who says officers are currently investigating the incident and more details will be released in the coming days. The studio is just on the cusp of their annual charity art auction and launch party. The board is deciding to move forward with the event, and in addition to the regular fundraising and auction choices, there's a new giving option for the Emergency Vandalism Recovery Fund. Fundraiser. It's nearly half of our budget is raised from that one event. So we just can't not do that. So we are rushing to that finish line as fast as we possibly can. We've also started a um, vandalism recovery fund. And both of the, both tickets and, and the sponsorships for uh, the charity art auction and for the vandalism uh, recovery fund will be found on our website at www.sculpturespace.org. The studio will continue to post updates on how the community can help on their Facebook page at Sculpture Space Inc. And as always, Eyewitness News will keep you up to date on the latest developments. And last week, you might remember when I spoke with Attorney General Letitia James regarding Utica's gun buyback event. It happened on Saturday of this past weekend, and it appears to have been a success. The Attorney General announced yesterday that a total of 296 firearms were turned into the Utica Police Department as part of their event. 177 of these firearms were actually ghost guns, and all guns, working or non-working, were accepted as part of a no-questions-asked policy. But events like this are just one of the ways to reduce gun violence across the board, and there's still more to be done. Attorney General Letitia James saying in a statement, quote, Every gun that was turned in is a potential tragedy prevented and a potential life saved. And I thank the Utica Police Department for their invaluable support and collaboration. To date, Attorney General James has taken more than 3,300 firearms out of communities through gun buyback events like this one, so we might start seeing even more. And Governor Hochul recently signed Dakota's Law, a new law that aims to help protect kids from lead poisoning. Capital correspondent Jamie DeLine tells us how this law came to be and what doctors will be required to do. From paint to pipes, lead has been used in a wide variety of products. If ingested, it could cause health problems, putting children especially at risk. Of course, the younger the child is, the more sensitive they are to the toxic effects of lead. Learning disabilities, uh, and it goes up from there. Uh, and low levels of lead intoxication uh, aren't, does not have any symptoms. It has a cumulative silent effect. So we're very concerned about lead. It's an issue Tisha Jones is bringing awareness to after her daughter Dakota was diagnosed with lead in her body at the age of four. I wanted to prevent the same things from happening 
to other, other families. That's why she, along with Senator Gustavo Rivera, worked to write Dakota's bill, legislation that would require annual lead screenings for children at their primary doctor's appointments. Screening means asking a series of questions of parents all the way up until their child is six years old, just to make sure that if a child is at risk, uh, if a child has any symptoms or any signs that they might have bled in their blood, that they would be given the opportunity to be tested, to have that child tested, as well as potentially having their uh, their place of, of domicile to actually be inspected. Governor Hochul recently signed this bill into law. Senator Rivera says the State Department of Health will be creating the questions that will be given to doctors. Dr. Jim Saperstone, a pediatrician, weighs in. Yeah, if states haven't done it, it's a great idea. And again, that's an American Academy guideline uh, when we read about the latest uh, guidelines that we need to uh, perform uh, when we see kids for their healthy checkup. So absolutely. As for Dakota, her mother says she's now in 11th grade and is into technology. She likes to code and she likes to do edits and things of that nature. And it, it keeps her pretty much busy, you know, with the brain damage. I can see that there were some effects, so we like to keep her doing positive things and things that she likes to do. Reporting in Albany, I'm Jamie DeLine. Coming up tonight on Eyewitness News at 10, I'll have more on NASA's Artemis 1 launch delay. This is Eyewitness News, first at 10. And in national news, NASA was forced to delay the launch of its moon rocket after some technical issues. But the highly anticipated flight is still expected to happen eventually. Hannah Brandt explains what comes next. Launch director Charlie Blackwell Thompson has called a scrub. The mission to take astronauts back to the moon hit a snag on Monday. We don't launch until it's right. Issues with fuel leaks and engine cooling kept the Artemis rocket on the ground, at least for now. You know, it's just part of the space business, and it's part of particularly a test flight. Engineers are working on fixing the rocket, and they plan to try the launch again soon, potentially as early as Friday. 
And they're going to work it. They'll get to the bottom of it. They'll get it fixed. And then we'll fly. Vice President Kamala Harris was there for the planned launch. And she says despite the delay, she's excited about the project and what it could accomplish in the future. This is with the goal of humans being able to live and work on the moon and with the next step being to travel to Mars. If NASA can successfully launch this test flight, the next step will be getting astronauts on board a flight around the moon. Then, they hope to send astronauts on a third mission to land on the moon in 2025. In Washington, I'm Hannah Brandt. Also tonight from Washington, it looks like more manufacturing jobs are making their way back to the U.S., something the Biden administration is very excited to see. Washington correspondent Basil John reports on this change to the job market. Good evening. Recent reports show an increase in the number of jobs coming back from overseas and the Biden administration wants to see more of it. Uh, we consider this a very welcome trend. White House Council of Economic Advisors Jared Bernstein says bringing manufacturing jobs back to the U.S. is an important part of strengthening the economy. Uh, we think it's really important to build much more resilient supply chains. A recent report from the Reshoring Initiative estimates nearly 350,000 jobs will return this year, a new high in a decade-long trend. It's not just that uh, the pace of uh, onshoring uh, is, uh, is ongoing, it's that it's accelerating. Reshoring Initiative founder and President Harry Moser says companies are recognizing it makes sense to keep production close to home. It's due to disruptions and fear of disruptions. It's due to the, the COVID, it's due to Suez Canal, it's due to Russia, Ukraine, and hanging over everything is the is the risk of China decoupling. However, Moser says the trend presents a challenge because not enough Americans are trained to work in manufacturing. Everybody wants to go to university and study sociology or philosophy or something, and some often not getting a job in that field. And while we have hundreds of thousands or a million job openings for people with skills in manufacturing. Moser is advocating for the administration to promote the skilled workforce so there will be enough recruits going forward. Reporting in Washington, I'm Basil John. Be sure to get our CNY homepage app to stay up to date on all the latest local news. But before we go to break, here's a preview of your weather with meteorologist Dan Mazlowski. Thanks, Shelby. We had some rain showers and thunderstorms moving through with more rain in the forecast for tomorrow as well as the humidity remaining high as well. I'll break it all down for you in your full weather forecast coming up right after the break.
Now, your eyewitness weather forecast. Good evening, meteorologist Santa Maslowski here with your checking on the weather. We're looking at a time lapse of downtown Utica throughout the day today. We had mostly sunny skies, so it was very hot and humid. We started out with those temperatures in the 70s, and we managed to get into the upper 80s during the afternoon hour. Some areas even hitting close to 90 degrees. We did have some thunderstorms during the later evening hours, so this was mainly in the north country. Now, for current conditions, we're sitting at 75 degrees. We have a very light breeze out of the northeast at 3 miles per hour. And those dew points in the upper 60s, so very humid out there, and it was downright tropical earlier today. And unfortunately, that'll continue into tomorrow. But by tomorrow evening, we have a cold front moving through, and that's really going to knock those dew point temperatures down into the upper 50s by the middle of the week on Wednesday. So more into that comfortable zone, and dropping even more so as we hit Thursday into the low and mid 50s. So in that pleasant zone as well. Now the reason why that we were so hot and humid throughout the day today was because of a low pressure system. That's with the warm front and that warm front has been pushing that warm and humid air into our area also bringing those showers and thunderstorms though as we head into tomorrow we'll see that cold front moving through which is going to be bringing another round of showers and thunderstorms there. Now, taking a closer look at radar, we did have a couple of thunderstorms in the north country, though that has since started to clear up, though we do have a chance to see a couple of scattered thunderstorms as we head throughout tonight with those low temperatures, very mild, warm, and humid, only dropping into the 60s and the lower 70s. 66 degrees as a low there in Old Ford, 71 in Utica, and 73 in Illion. For those high temperatures tomorrow, getting into the 70s and low to mid 80s, 77 there in in the North Country, so a little bit cooler there. We'll be in the mid 80s here in the Mohawk Valley, 82 degrees in uh, Cooperstown, and 83 in Oneonta. Now, for the future cast, moving it forward tonight, a couple of scattered rain showers and thunderstorms possible. As we head into tomorrow morning for your morning commute, looking good. We're on the drier side, partly cloudy skies. So, as we head into the later afternoon hours from around 2 p.m. all the way into about 8 p.m., that's when we have some thunderstorms moving through. Could get a little bit dicey, especially if you're on the roads. We could get some really gusty winds as well as some downpours, so some quick, intense bursts of rain showers, and this will continue as we head throughout those evening hours, though it'll start to wind down as we head throughout the night into Wednesday morning. We still have a chance to see a couple of scattered rain showers for your Wednesday morning commute, though as we head into the afternoon hours, we'll see those rain showers fizzling out. We'll have plenty of sunshine as we head into Wednesday evening. Now to recap for tonight, we'll have those scattered thunderstorms popping up light breeze as well as those low temperatures in the lower 70s, so very warm and humid. Definitely not a night where you want to open up the window before you head to bed. As we head into tomorrow, we'll have those thunderstorms mainly during the afternoon hours. We'll have a breeze out of the southwest at 10 miles per hour, though it could get much more gusty within those thunderstorms, and we'll have those high temperatures getting into the mid-80s. Now for your seven-day forecast, as we head into tomorrow night, low temperatures dropping into the lower 60s, though it still will be on the warmer end. And as we head into Wednesday, like I said before, some scattered rain showers mainly during the morning hours so for your morning commute and we'll see those temperatures really dropping as we head into Thursday could get a little bit of a taste of fall because even though the high temperature is at 73 degrees most of the day on Thursday it looks like it's going to be in the 60s though we get right back into the 80s as we hit Friday with mostly sunny skies there as we head into Saturday that's when we're going to see the humidity and the heat creeping up on us again those high temperatures in the mid and upper 80s Though, as we head into Sunday, temperatures back into the 70s, so it looks like more of a roller coaster ride of temperatures as we head throughout the seven day forecast. We'll have a mix of clouds and sunshine there on Sunday, and then as we kick off the start next week on Monday, continuing with those drier conditions, mix of clouds and sunshine, temperatures getting to the lower 80s. Thanks, Dan. I'm definitely excited for the fall weather. I don't know about you. I know. I'm excited for it, too. I know it's a little bit early. We're still in August, though I'm always longing for those fall temperatures. Yeah. Our sports director, Brendan Miller, has your update on local sports coming up right after the break.
Yeah, check, check. One, two, three. Mic check. One, two, three. Check. Yep. It's time for Eyewitness Sports. Good evening, I'm Brendan Miller with Eyewitness Sports. The girls portion of the New York High School basketball tournament kicked off today. A team made up of players from Utica and the Mohawk Valley playing against the team from the Finger Lakes at 11 a.m. in the opening game. The ladies won that game in pretty dominant fashion, doubling up the Finger Lakes squad by a final score of 42 to 20. So with the win, they advanced to play one of the two Syracuse teams involved in the tournament. Cuse had two teams because the Buffalo region team dropped out. This is the original Syracuse roster that was put together to compete, and the Mohawk Valley would take them down as well by a final of 41 to 36. So they start 2 0 and advance to the semifinal where they will play Albany. Albany took down Binghamton in the other quarterfinal game. The two teams today, the Re Utica Region team, can now claim the best overall record with the two wins among regions through both the boys' and girls' tournaments. The boys went 3 and 1, losing only the championship game in their tournament, bringing the region's overall record to 5 and 1, while Syracuse is in second place with a 5 and 3 overall record. The ladies will have to wait until noon tomorrow for their semifinal against Albany and the chance to make it to the championship out of the winner's bracket. That game is at noon. So the venue for that tournament is the New York State Fairgrounds, the outdoor courts to be precise, but some news today on another local venue that is hoping to host tournaments for local athletes sometime in the coming months, the Nexus Center. The center had posted a few pictures last week of construction updates, but today we got a big dump of photos as the concrete is down on each of the three multi-purpose playing surfaces being installed and the infrastructure has been put up for the concession stands and coffee shop that will be included in the final plan. As of right now, the grand opening series is scheduled for November 11th through 13th, a junior hockey tournament, but the center has also scheduled some non-hockey events for the future of the building, including the 2023 Northeast Tattoo Expo scheduled in June of next year. The plan for the center is to be home of the Utica women's ice hockey team and the Utica Junior Comets in the near future, with luxury boxes, over 25 locker rooms, commercial office space, and college classrooms, among other amenities, being built in the over 169,000 square foot space. For now, that's all for sports. Check out SteveMyHomePage.com for your top sports stories. There's more eyewitness news after the break.
Eyewitness News First at 10 continues. State agencies and advocates addressing the opioid epidemic today. The state's Opioid Settlement Fund Board met with the Office of Addiction Services in support to discuss how funds from these lawsuits should be used. Capital correspondent Emil Taligi has the details. You know, what I'm concerned about with the Opioid Advisory Council is them pumping more money into a failing system. Alexis Pluse lost her son to a heroin overdose in 2014. Pluse is executive director of Truth Farm, an organization that raises awareness and advocates policy change. She says she hasn't seen any good solutions from the board, even with new funds. Pluse and other members of the public joined the advisory board meeting holding handcrafted tomb signs with names of loved ones lost to addiction. Dr. Chinazo Cunningham is commissioner of Oasis. She says the board will come up with a recommendation report for the state legislature and the governor in November, which will be used in the budget making process process for next year. So what we've heard a lot from the board is um, issues around harm reduction, so really focusing on reducing harms, keeping people alive and expanding those services. Some of the things include naloxone, some of those include outreach and meeting where people where they are, some of that includes fentanyl test strips. Commissioner Cunningham says the board has also talked about issues like helping those who have substance abuse and mental health issues, which is why they're working with the Office of Mental Health. Plus says she'd like to see a program that doesn't operate using the punishment system, where those in recovery are reported to CPS, parole, or probation. One of the things that I think that people should notice is the fact that enrollment in treatment programs has not increased at all while overdose fatalities continue to increase. And what that should tell us is that our treatment programs are not welcoming to the people who need the assistance and the help. In Albany, I'm El Taligi. And in some lighter news, if your morning commute takes you across North Genesee Street, you may have encountered the occasional jam up at the intersection of North Genesee and Wurz Ave due to cars lined up at the drive through window of Dunkin' Donuts. Well, the signs are up, and it won't be long before the North Jenny Coffee Wars officially begin. Starbucks is only days away from the opening of their latest shop, a standalone structure next door to the Fairfield Inn. Starbucks is the world's largest coffee house chain, with their first local presence located inside Barnes & Noble Bookstore in Consumer Square. That's in New Hartford. A year ago, they opened a cafe somewhere else in Consumer Square, but this will be the first Starbucks in Utica. So in the battle of the drive throughs you will get a choice. And of course, there's always a third option on the other side of the bridge, Utica Coffee. We'll close out the broadcast when we return. It's New York Lottery's numbers win four and take five drawings for Monday evening, August 29th, 2022. Being observed by KPMG. I'm Kylie McDonald. Now here's tonight's number. The first ball up is one. The next is six. And the last is eight. Making tonight's number 168. Tomorrow's Mega Millions jackpot is $153 million. And now win four. The first ball up is zero. The next is two. The next is five. And the last is nine. Making tonight's win four number 0259. Now it's time for tonight's Take 5 drawing. Last night we had over 3,000 Take 5 cash winners. Tonight's winning take five numbers are 11, 7, 37, 13, and 23. Congratulations to all our winners. Thank you for joining us and have a great night.
Taking one last look at the seven day forecast, some showers and thunderstorms mainly during the afternoon hours tomorrow with temperatures getting to the mid 80s. We have some scattered rain showers on Wednesday, mainly during the morning hours, and we'll see temperatures cooling down to the lower 70s by Thursday. Though dry as we head into this weekend, mostly sunny skies on Friday and Saturday with temperatures getting to the 80s. Thanks, Dan. And thank you for joining us for Eyewitness News First at 10. We'll see you back here again tomorrow.